Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Ross Jordan. I'm the curatorial manager here at the Jan Adams Hull House Museum. Jan Adams Hull House Museum is located on the campus of the University of Illinois at Chicago and draws upon the legacy and international peace activist, suffragist, and feminist Jane Adams and other social reformers who lived and worked alongside their immigrant neighbors to expand democracy on the near west side of Chicago. The museum connects the histories of the whole house settlement to the present day social justice issues. Today's program does just that. It continues our Suffrage and Sentinel series. We will be joined by Anya Jabbar, author of Sophonism of Breckenridge, Championing Women's Activism in Modern America and Breckenridge Family Members. This program supports the museum's two current exhibitions that commemorate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. The exhibition, Why Women Should Vote, titled after a 1910 essay by Jane Adams, traces women's voter education efforts in Illinois and highlights Ida B. Wells and the history of racism within the suffrage movement. True Peace, the Presence of Justice, titled after the phrase attributed to Jane Adams juxtaposes the international peace and human rights activism led by uh, women in opposition to World War I with present day challenges to policing and prisons, campaigns that are often led by women in queer communities of color. You can visit both these exhibitions virtually on our website, wholehousemuseum.org. Many of you are joining us from community libraries across Illinois whose partnership during this pandemic has made this virtual program and our virtual exhibitions accessible to the public. We welcome and thank our partners from Reaching Across Illinois Library Systems, Aurora Public Library, Gail Borden Public Library, Arlington Heights Memorial Library, and Schaumburg Township District Library. This program is also supported by funds from the Terra Foundation of American Art. For today's program, we will first hear from author Anya Jabor, who will be followed by Breckenridge family members. Um, you will have a chance to ask questions near the end, and you can use the Q&A function for that. Um, folks should be aware that we are, um, people are joining from all sorts of different Facebook pages, so we won't be able to see all the questions and comments, um, but we will gather them up um, and try to answer them on our social media pages um, in the future. Uh, we are very lucky to be joined by Anya Jabor today. Anya Jabor is a Regents Professor of History at the University of Montana, where she has taught US history and US women's history since 1995. She has published several books and articles on women, families, and children in the 19th century South before turning her attention to women's activism in the 20th century in Chicago. Her most recent book, A Biography of the Forgotten Feminists, Sophonisba Breckenridge, received the Illinois Historical Society's Award for Superior Achievement. Her research on Breckenridge and her fellow reformers has been featured in Washington Post, The Conversation, and The Huffington Post. Welcome, Anya Jabor. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Ross, and for all of the work that you've done to make this event possible. It's really a thrill to be able to participate in this great series of events in honor of the centennial of the 19th Amendment. I'm especially happy to be able to share this event with members of the Breckenridge family who are carrying on the legacy of the remarkable member of a renowned family, Sophonisba Breckenridge. Today, I will also be addressing Breckenridge's collaborations with her fellow suffragist and social justice activist, Jane Adams, whose birthday we are also celebrating at this event. I wanna thank both Jennifer Scott and Ross Jordan of the Jane Adams Hull House Museum for making all of these arrangements and Madeline Breckenridge and Jessica Heinley, who you'll meet in a little bit, who are carrying on the Breckenridge family tradition of public service. I also want to 
acknowledge and thank the many libraries that are also participating in co-sponsoring this event and sharing it widely. Along those lines, I should probably also make sure to thank Amanda Garcia, who is doing all of our tech behind the scenes and really uh, making this possible. So the title of my presentation today is Championing Women's Activism in Modern America, Soap and Isbeth Breckenridge, Jane Addams, and Social Justice. The subject of my new book worked closely with Jane Addams for decades. Along with other reformers affiliated with Hull House, the two women championed labor legislation, provided services to immigrants, demanded civil rights for African Americans, promoted women's suffrage, advocated for world peace. Together, they were a powerful force for social justice. Born in Lexington, Kentucky in 1866, Sophie Nisba Preston Breckenridge, known as Nisba, was destined to carry on the family tradition of public service. After earning her bachelor's degree at Wellesley College in 1888, Breckenridge taught mathematics in Washington, DC, and practiced law in Lexington, Kentucky, before relocating to Chicago to pursue further education at the new co-educational University of Chicago. After her earning her MA, in 1897 and her PhD in 1901 in political science, she graduated with her Juris Doctorate in 1904 at the top of the law school's first graduating class. After completing her studies, she taught a pioneering course on the legal and economic position of women that brought her into contact with the Second City's labor organizers and social reformers. Breckenridge's concern about the plight of working women initiated her long association with Hull House and its head resident, Jane Adams. In 1905, at Adams' suggestion, she accepted an appointment as Inspector of Yards, investigating women's working conditions in Chicago's infamous meatpacking district. Breckenridge spent more than four months inspecting the facilities and interviewing the employees of Packingtown, mostly immigrant girls and young women between the ages of 16 and 22. Working in cold windowless rooms and standing on dirty, blood-soaked, rotting wooden floors, the workers toiled without relief in a humid atmosphere, heavy with the odors of rotten wood, decayed meats, stinking offal, and human waste from the doorless privies that vented directly into the workrooms. Breckenridge found her task exhausting, both physically and emotionally. To Adams, she confessed, I was getting where I could not sleep. The vision of the day's work presses in so, not my own day's work, but that of the crews of girls I see marching past me now. After her encounter with the packing houses of Porkopolis, Breckenridge became a passionate advocate of so-called protective legislation. With the support of settlement house workers, club women, and trade unionists, she persuaded the US Labor Department to fund a full-scale investigation of wage-earning women and children throughout the nation. The resulting report, published between 1910 and 1913, comprised 19 volumes of statistical data on the wages and working conditions of female and child workers. The report also provided the basis for the establishment of two new federal bureaus, the US Children's Bureau and the US Women's Bureau. These government agencies would advocate for a ban on child labor and better working conditions for women for decades to come. In 1938, after more than 30 years of advocacy, the Fair Labor Standards Act finally established maximum hours and minimum wages for both male and female workers, as well as instituting a federal ban on child labor. Breckenridge's work on behalf of working women led to an invitation to live and work at Hull House. As Russell Ballard, one of the few male residents put it, a brilliant company of women were drawn to the settlement 
a pioneer in the promotion of social change. The scholarly and talented Sophie Nisbeth Breckenridge joined the company in 1907 to become one of Miss Adams' closest friends and most helpful associates. Although her responsibilities at the University of Chicago prevented her from living at Hull House full time, Breckenridge spent all of her vacation quarters and much of her limited free time at Hull House, where she was listed as an official resident from 1907 until 1921. Soon after Breckenridge took up residence at Hull House, she joined a special committee investigating the conditions confronting young immigrant women who arrived in the city, lost, alone, and vulnerable to both sexual and economic exploitation. A typical case was that of Bozina Tablick. Former Hull House resident Edith Abbott later explained that Pavlik was a nice young Bohemian immigrant girl who was so eager for work that she had taken the first job she could find in a saloon. Abbott continued, the saloon keeper abused her shamefully and then turned her out when he found that she was to become the mother of his illegitimate child. Hull House residents helped Pavlik file charges, obtain childcare, learn English, gain citizenship, and find work. But Breckenridge and Adams realized that the challenges confronting immigrants were too widespread for either individual assistance or existing service agencies to address. As Adams explained the problem, every year we have heard of girls who did not arrive when their families expected them. And although their parents frantically met one train after another, the ultimate fate of the girls could never be discovered. She continued, we have constantly seen the exploitation of the newly arrived immigrant by his shrewd countrymen in league with the unscrupulous American. From time to time, we have known children detained in New York and even deported whose parents had no clear understanding of the difficulty. To address these issues, Breckenridge and Adams established the Immigrants Protective League in 1908. The League provided essential assistance to Chicago's immigrants. One of the League's first major accomplishments was establishing a kind of immigration station to welcome new arrivals. Immigrants met with League agents chosen to represent the nationalities and speak the languages of their clients who helped orient them to the city. Agents provided newcomers with information about employment opportunities, social services, and evening classes. They also helped new arrivals steer clear of unscrupulous cab drivers, fraudulent employment agents, and the ever-present cadets who recruited young women into prostitution. Breckenridge also persuaded local women's clubs to provide funds for the League to provide temporary housing for young immigrant women. In only four years, the League served close to 80,000 immigrants at its welcome station. In addition to providing services for immigrants, Breckenridge's work at the League laid the groundwork for research on naturalization and citizenship, which in turn allowed her to influence the 1930 Cable Act, which eased the path to citizenship for immigrant women. Both Breckenridge and Adams were concerned about what Breckenridge called race prejudice, as well as with immigrant welfare. Both women were members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which called attention to the horrific practice of lynching and spearheaded a prolonged but unsuccessful effort to adopt federal anti-lynching laws. In addition, Breckenridge challenged racial discrimination in Chicago's segregated schools and neighborhoods. She also helped develop an innovative program that provided medical services and foster care to Chicago's African-American children. As in so many other arenas, Breckenridge ultimately translated her concerns about African-Americans into federal policy. As an advisor for programs established under the 1935 Social Security Act, 
She made it her mission to ensure that public welfare programs established under the New Deal extended their services to Black Americans. Both Adams and Breckenridge were lifelong supporters of women's rights. In 1911, they were elected vice presidents of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, the mainstream suffrage organization known as NASA for short. At the time, NASA and the suffrage movement more generally were exhibiting what historians call a shift from justice to expediency. Rather than demanding equal rights, many leaders instead emphasized gender distinctions. Adams and Breckenridge both used rhetoric, emphasizing women's differences from men. As founding members of the Women's City Club of Chicago, they may have helped design the club's popular pro-suffrage graphic seen here, which urged women to participate in local politics or municipal housekeeping by illustrating the links that connected domestic life with city government. The National American Women's Suffrage Association subsequently adopted this image for use on suffrage flyers and pamphlets. However, Breckenridge also insisted on gender equality. For instance, in 1912, she gave a speech in which she asserted that women needed the ballot to combat poverty, disease, unequal distribution of wealth, special privilege, and unequal justice. Like many suffragists of her era, Breckenridge believed that women would be more inclined than men to vote for a reform. With the vote, then, wives and mothers would become social housekeepers who would clean up politics, and municipal mothers who would prioritize the needs of children. But Breckenridge also insisted that women deserved the vote as a matter of simple justice. What we want is the ballot, she concluded. We demand it, and that demand is an unanswerable argument. At the same time that the suffrage movement adopted arguments based on gender differences, some white suffragists also increasingly emphasized racial, class, and ethnic differences. NASA excluded African American women. Some white suffrage leaders also called for educated suffrage, a sort of code for literacy requirements that would extend voting rights to educated white native born women, but prevent African Americans and immigrants from casting ballots. In 1911, civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois, editor of the NAACP publication, The Crisis, critiqued the national suffrage organization's racism. He warned that the movement's mission was becoming votes for white women only. As advocates for immigrant welfare and civil rights, as well as woman suffrage, Breckenridge and Adams rejected exclusionary strategies. They protested proposed literacy tests for immigrants. They also welcomed African-American participation in the movement. Breckenridge invited Du Bois to speak at the suffrage organization's 1912 meeting, where he gave a speech advocating what he called a democracy of sex and color. By hosting Du Bois at the annual convention, Breckenridge and Adams hoped to facilitate cooperation between the movements for women's rights and African-American rights. However, internal dissension in the suffrage movement soon caused both women to dread meetings of NASA's national board which Adams compared to being immersed in boiling oil. Tensions came to a head in fall 1912. In defiance of the suffrage organization's traditional commitment to nonpartisanship, Breckenridge and Adams both declared their support for progressive party presidential candidate, Theodore Roosevelt. They not only convinced the third party candidate to support women's suffrage, but they also helped shape the Progressive Party's agenda. 
The party's platform, known as the Contract with the People, was modeled on the platform of industrial minimums adopted at the 1912 National Conference of Charities and Corrections, where both women played prominent roles. The platform included demands for a living wage, unemployment insurance, and workers' compensation for all wage earners, as well as special protections for women and children in the workforce. However, Breckenridge and Adams failed to convince NASA leadership that the suffrage movement should use party politics to promote either women's rights or social welfare. Instead, President Anna Howard Shaw publicly denounced what she called party ties. This uncomfortable situation soon led both Adams and Breckenridge to resign their posts in the National Suffrage Organization. Breckenridge and Adams remained active in the suffrage movement. But after leaving office in NASA, they shifted their focus away from the National Suffrage Organization toward the Women's Peace Party, which they co-founded in 1915 in response to armed conflict in Europe, what would later become known as World War I. The Women's Peace Party, not in fact a political party, was the first US pacifist group to treat peace as a women's issue. Many members believed that women had a special responsibility to protect life and thus to prevent war. The party called on women as the mother half of humanity to oppose the reckless destruction of human life that resulted from warfare. At the same time that they emphasized women's special responsibility for peace work, feminist pacifists also demanded equal political rights for women. They believed that women's full participation in the political process was essential to ending global conflict. Thus, the Women's Peace Party worked for both women's rights and world peace. Adams and Breckenridge represented this organization at an international feminist pacifist gathering known as the International Congress of Women held at The Hague in 1915. The Congress enthusiastically adopted many of the measures proposed by the Women's Peace Party. They called for the creation of an international peacekeeping body, national self-determination for all countries, and of course, equal political participation for women. Following the Congress, Adams joined a delegation of women that visited political and religious leaders of both neutral and belligerent nations to urge them to seek peaceful solutions to the ongoing war. After Adams returned to the United States, she and Breckenridge attempted to persuade President Woodrow Wilson to intervene in the European conflict as a neutral intermediary. They also appeared before the US House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs to support a proposal to establish a commission for enduring peace. Despite their best efforts, American pacifists were unable either to halt the ongoing war or to prevent the United States entry into it. Once hostilities had ceased, Breckenridge and Adams, now part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the successor group to the Women's Peace Party, sought new routes to enduring peace. They achieved a partial victory in the establishment of the League of Nations which incorporated many of the principles adopted at the International Congress of Women. Although the US failed to join this organization, Adams and Breckenridge persisted in promoting their vision of a peaceful world. In 1923, they submitted a joint proposal for the American Peace Award. Their plan called for the United States to join the World Court and the League of Nations. They also demanded that the US refrain from defending the interests of private businesses abroad, end both the production and the sale of armaments, and cooperate with other nations in a process of universal disarmament. 
Finally, they recommended offering a long moratorium to Germany to help that nation pay war reparations without negative economic repercussions. Their plan thus called for the United States to promote peace, not only by agreeing to abide by arbitration in future disputes and participating in a process of universal disarmament, but also by removing the reasons for rising resentment in Germany that would soon allow Adolf Hitler to rise to power. Sadly, their plan was never implemented. Nonetheless, in the years after the Second World War, many of their ideas would be adopted by the United Nations. Adams did not live to see this victory. Although she had been condemned as the most dangerous woman in America for her pacifism during World War I, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931 five years before her death in 1936. Breckenridge, however, persisted in her outspoken opposition to war until her own death in 1948. Later that year, the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which enunciated many of her most cherished principles. The preamble begins with this statement. Recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. It was a suitable, if belated, obituary for both Adams and Breckenridge, who dedicated their lives to promoting equal rights and world peace. Thank you again for participating in this event, and I am looking forward to the conversation that we are going to have now. Thank you, Anya. <laughs> that was lovely. That was great. Um, and there's so many connections to the our contemporary moment. It's hard to even begin. Um, but now we want to bring in our other panelists to have a conversation um, about legacy and history. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce Madeline Breckenridge. Uh, uh, she is the daughter of Henry S. Breckenridge, who is Sophie Nisba Preston Breckenridge's first cousin. Um, she is a LCSW social worker, a Vipsana meditator, a mother of two and a lifelong resident of New York City where she has had her professional practice since 1976. Uh, her education was at the George Washington University and the Hunter, Hunter College School of Social Work. Jessica Heinley is related by marriage to the Breckenridge family. She is a licensed clinical social worker and has been a, social, a school social worker for the past 17 years with Chicago Public Schools. She has previous practice experience with child welfare and community mental health agencies in Chicago. Her education was in Springfield College, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign School of Social Work and the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, after this discussion, um, we'll also have a chance to do Q&A. So if you have questions, please um, begin thinking about them to send them in um, for that. Uh, with that, welcome to our other panelists. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, everybody. I'm Madeline Breckenridge, as just introduced by Ross. And uh, I'm going to use my little phone here to try to keep to my time frame. I don't know about Sophonisba, but the rest of the Breckenridges can go on forever about almost anything. So um, in my branch of the family, at least that's true. I did not know very much about Sophonisba. My father and Sophonisba shared a grandfather and grandmother who were uh, Robert Jefferson Breckenridge and Sophonisba Preston Breckenridge for whom our Sophonisba here today was named. So she had, uh, as is uh, detailed in a very interesting way in Anya's book, she had uh, uh, one set of grandparents full out supporting the Confederacy and another set of grandparents full out supporting the Union because Robert J was an abolitionist from uh, the earliest days. So that must have been an interesting situation for her. Uh, I would say that um, 
in, in some ways politically, she and my father, who was her first cousin, but exactly 20 years younger, um, crossed, crossed roles there, uh, at least as I see politics, in that um, while she was working for peace and freedom, my father was the assistant secretary of war under Wilson. While she was uh, supporting Roosevelt, he was a, a full out opponent of Roosevelt, even later forming a third party to, to hopefully prevent his nomination. While she stood for every social policy that has just been detailed by Anya, my, my father probably stood against every single one of those, except perhaps the right to vote. <laughs> um, certainly any federal social programs uh, were things he was he was very much against. So, in in my I did not know her. She died a year before I was born. But um, in our branch of the family, which was not her branch of the family at that point in time, um, we uh, there was a, a, a wide tolerance of different politics and lots of very lively conflict around those differences, uh, often fueled by by quite a bit of Kentucky bourbon, but, but not in a state of drunkenness, just in a state of really activated political, political debate. And then everyone was friendly the next morning. I had been told that that was the case of the Civil War generation as well. But I learned a lot from your book, Anya, and to see that there really were rifts and estrangements and consequences. So I think by the time I was born, those had been uh, woven into a somewhat romanticized and inaccurate history. And uh, that's about all I know about the way in which Sophonispa grew up. But I do know that I never heard about her from my family as she was forgotten in history, as Anya uh, details. Uh, she was also not spoken about really in family life. She was, uh, I did know her name and I knew she was the first woman admitted to the bar in Kentucky. And those were the two, and I knew that she taught at the University of Chicago. So in growing up, I'd always thought she was an academic and intelligent and so forth, but that was about it. And uh, I really, my father was friends with her brother Deshay, so there was certainly some connection from the in, within the family, but I never heard anything about her. What is to me even worse is that I went through two years of graduate social work school in Hunter College School of Social Work, which is very focused on settlement houses and, the, and immigration and all of the early social work in New York. And I never heard her name there either. And in, in all of the courses that covered the very era in which she was at, incredibly active, I never heard a thing about her. I first really heard about her in a direct and personal way when I went to an event in the East Village of a women's uh, a whim, uh, a wow event, women's one world festival, art, performance art, all these things. And this one was quite a big event within that festival and you had to get tickets. So when I gave my ticket at the door with my name and so forth, the ticket taker said, oh, are you related to Sophonisba Breckenridge, the famous lesbian social worker? <laughs> and I, had, I, I didn't know she was famous. I didn't know she was a social worker. And I certainly didn't know what we today would call queer. So I didn't know any of those things. But then I became very interested in her, but didn't really learn very much. And I, at the reunion last year, we decided, I, it became my turn to do the reunion. And I, I thought, well, let's find out about the women. This is now 50 years after my interest was peaked, but still <laughs> better late than never said, let's find out a little more about the women who really accomplished in the family. What's interesting to me is the two other women who accomplished at a level of uh, international uh, achievement in different fields. 
were about my father's age. They were about 20 years younger than Sophie Nisba. And I suspect that her model influenced them greatly as women who did not choose to have families or were not able to have families and who each took their uh, connections and their privileges into uh, incredibly profound work for the world. When we began to learn about Sophonisba, and I chose Chicago because of Sophonisba, still knowing nothing. Uh, and when I began to learn about her, we realized she should be the entire focus of that reunion. And she was, and I learned so much at the University of Chicago about her temperament, about her courage, about her incredible brilliance and stamina and activism. And it was really, really thrilling. None of us who came had that knowledge in any way, shape or form. We came from different branches of the family, but none of us had grown up hearing about her. Those who were old enough, uh, uh, I don't think even really knew her in more than a, a, an acquaintance type way. And it was, it was very, very uh, thrilling to find out about her and be inspired by her. And I felt in the course of that reunion, just a, a shift upward in my own standards, in my own commitment, in, my, in the breadth of my own thinking about what could be done in this world. God knows we certainly need a lot done right now. And, and she was so ahead of her time. She was just an amazing, amazing person. It's a gift to be related to her um, and uh, to learn more about her. And I'm so thankful to you, Anya, for writing this wonderful book. And I met Jessica. I met <laughs> Jessica, who's on that. <laughs> that was another very exciting thing because we're both social workers and we could go around the special collections and, and look at everything and say, she did that, she started. I never knew she started the first research journal. I, I, I didn't know anything. So to you, Jessica. So, um, yes, I, you know, I was so honored uh, to be asked to, to speak at this webinar um, and attend the uh, family reunion last summer at uh, University of Chicago. Um, uh, Carlisle Carter is my stepmother, who is a Breckenridge family descendant, and um, she invited me, and, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, my my it, connection to Sofonisba, or my discovery of Sofonisba, is kind of a funny story. Um, when I was a, a graduate student at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, uh, we were given, I was given an assignment in one of my classes to write a one page paper about a prominent person in the field of social work. So, um, you know, I had attended many family gatherings of Breckenridge descendants and, and um, you know, was very well aware of the family history. So um, while I was, uh, you know, in the library researching, I opened the Encyclopedia of Social Work and came across Sophonisba Breckenridge. And I thought, hmm, I've never, I wonder if she's related to the, you know, to my uh, stepmother's family, the Breckenridges. So I'd never heard of her. I called Carlisle and Carlisle said, well, you know, I'm not sure, but uh, if she is, but why don't you call my mother who's, you know, more informed on family history, who is Mary Carter. So, um, talked with Mary Carter, who then said, Jessica, absolutely, she is related to the Breckenridges. She did all kinds of very important, you know, social service work. And I just was, I'd never heard of her and nor had Carlisle. <laughs> so, you know, her name never came up in all of the family discussions I was a part of, of uh, Breckenridge family history. And um, so, uh, I, I just, you know, I, I have to echo, uh, Anya, your comments in the book. I'm reading the book right now. I'm on page 94, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, how she <laughs> got me <laughs> forgotten to history. And then when I came to the reunion last summer, uh, was just blown away by her accomplishments and her brilliance. And, um, you know, I, I, I talking with Madeline, I said, you know, 
she's a founding mother of the social work profession. I mean, I, I can make so many connections of what I do in my own work as a social worker to, to her, um, you know, all of the things she developed, the, the social policy, the, the, the journal she wrote, her classes. I mean, I mean, it's just amazing to, to have learned about her. And um, I'm, I'm continuing to learn uh, through reading your book, <laughs> Anya. So um, thank you for having me, uh, allowing me to be a part of this conversation, so. Well, thank you both so much for being here. It's, um, it's really exciting to get a chance to actually talk with, um, talk with actual Breckenridge descendants. <laughs> um, and so I'm really struck in both of your accounts about how you knew so little about, about Sophonisba Breckenridge and about who she was and what she did. And because when I first started my own research on her, I was struck by the same thing. I kept thinking, how in the world, I mean, at that point, I'd only been teaching U.S. women's history for 15 years, but, you know, um, but, uh, but still, I was like, how in the world have I been teaching the subject matter for all of these years? And I have never even heard of this woman who accomplished so much in so many areas that I had been teaching about at that point for a decade and a half. And I mean, it was almost like this kind of checklist of women and progressive reform. And, you know, I'd be like, oh, she did that too. Oh, she did that too. Oh, she did that too, right? Um, and so, I mean, I spent a lot of time kind of wrestling with this question of why has she been forgotten? Um, I'm really curious to know your thoughts as family members. I mean, I have theories on why she's been forgotten sort of in the academy, um, but I'm wondering about your thoughts as family members about why she's been forgotten or at least only um, partially uh, remembered um, within, within the family. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, family stories uh, were a big thing. I went to, because uh, my father was 64 when I was born. So I was in Lexington many, many times for funerals <laughs> as this generation passed. And there were always many, many family stories, but all of them were about the men. Really, if you, uh, if you listened to all of them and recorded all of them, you would think that uh, there were only Breckenridge men. And I think that's, uh, that's probably the main reason, other than it was a slightly different branch of the family at that point and politically at odds. Uh, so, those are the reasons I would imagine, but women just weren't important. It wasn't really, there were a couple of jokes because they all told jokes about each other. And the only time I did hear her was in the jokes that, that there was a lot of, someone once said, well, uh, Sophie Nisba was a cousin Nisba is how she was, I heard her mentioned a few times. I said, cousin Nisba was just educated beyond her intelligence. That was the comment. That was the comment, the only comment, the only comment I heard about her growing up, which I now see probably meant that they differed vastly in their political positions. But uh, at the time, I didn't know what it meant, but it was, it was uh, I wouldn't say demeaning because they did have that style of talking, but it certainly wasn't the, the holy admiration that was given for all the accomplishments of all the male ancestors. That's... Yeah. That's my. Wow. What do you think, Jessica? Um, I, you know, I really don't have an explanation for you, Anya, as to why there wasn't more discussion. Um, I, you know, I did hear about, um, so, you know, the, the family member who was head of the Frontier Nursing Service, Mary, I think it's Mary Breckenridge. Mary, Mary Breckenridge. Yes. Madeline McDowell Breckenridge. I remember conversations about, you know, John Cabell Breckenridge. Um, I, I, I mean, I honestly don't have an answer for that. Um, she, I, you know, I didn't even know she received the Nobel Peace Prize. That's news to me. Um, That's Jane Addams. Oh, Jane, Jane. did? Or was it Sophonie's Okay. Yeah. No, Jane. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, I, I'm, I'm honestly, I, I, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's really puzzling. It's really, really puzzling to me. 
Yeah, I mean, I wonder, I wonder, I mean, Madeline was referring to the political differences and of course, Sophie Nisba left um, her home state of Kentucky and um, uh, never went back for any period of time once she started at the University of Chicago. She said in her memoirs that um, after her first semester at the University of Chicago, she never went back to Kentucky without a return ticket to Chicago in her, in her handbag, right? So, um, I mean, it was a, um, which may be apocryphal, but I think captures her, emo the emotional reality, if not the factual reality that she had very much shifted her allegiances away from Kentucky and towards Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, in her case, away from her Confederate upbringing um, and toward a life that was dedicated to equality for all. Um, and she certainly had a, a complicated relationship with her family of origin. I mean, her immediate um, family of origin. She adored her father, absolutely adored her father, did her best to kind of portray him as an advocate for racial justice, which is kind of a neat trick for somebody who came up with Kentucky's version of the poll tax and defended Klansmen, but she she did her best because she adored him so much. Um, had always had kind of a difficult relationship with her mother, um, who had a was part of this break that Madeline was referring to before between the Confederate and the Union uh, branches of the family during the Civil War. But both of her parents died young, and then. Sophie Nisba was sort of close to her brother Deshay, who ultimately adopted, not wholeheartedly, but to some degree, her commitment to uh, progressive reform, um, as, and so did um, his wife, um, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge. Madeline, your namesake. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and and uh, she was also very close to her sister Curry, uh, actually Mary Curry, but she was known as Curry who became a nurse for the Red Cross during World War I, but she died young. Um, she was even sort of close to her brother Robert who had really troubled youth and went off to sea and um, finally returned and he was um, suffered from multiple addictions uh, to gambling and alcohol and drugs. Uh, Nisba actually supported him and his children um, in later life. Um, not at all close to her sister, Ella, who was very much in her mother's image, this sort of unreconstructed Confederate, I mean, unabashedly white supremacist. Uh, they were not close at all. Um, in fact, um, Ella wrote her own memoirs, which are, you know, 200 plus pages in typescript. And she mentions Nisba maybe twice in all of that time. Um, clearly, um, there was something going on with that. And really late in life, in I think 1945, when she was writing her memoirs, Nisba Breckenridge um, reflected that she was, you know, sad that she felt so distant from her surviving family, which at that point really was um, just Robert um, and Ella Deshay and Curry had both died, and she, you know, felt mournful about that lost family connection. So. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think that probably has contributed to it in terms of the family lore. What do you think about, I mean, you're both social yeah. workers. How in the world, I mean, I agree with you. How in the world did you, you know, get into or through, you know, high powered social work programs without hearing of her? I mean, what's that about? But I, I did not hear about her. I mean, we didn't, we, you know, we talked about some of her, yeah, obviously Jane Adams and Florence Kelly and the Abbott sisters. Uh, I don't remember Sophie Nisba being really highlight. I don't think I also heard her name either. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, she has done so much for social welfare in this country. Uh, she really needs to be mentioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, you know, I think there are two other factors that I don't know about in the social work education world, but in the family world, I think there were probably two other factors because as you mentioned, Anya, other women of some prominence a little bit later than she, but they were mentioned. And I did know more about what they did for various reasons. 
but I'm sure her sexuality played a part in that. Her whatever it was, um, it, what it appeared to be, the other several well-known family members were clearly single but heterosexual. They were clearly heterosexual. And that was, uh, so I would think there's a certain amount of heterocentrism going on there and fear for the daughters or something like that. And, uh, and also that's guess, but I would guess it's a good guess. And the other thing is something I think we should mention politically because of the times we're in now. And that is that uh, with, with any group that's marginalized where there's, there are tremendous interests seeking to limit or eradicate them having a real voice, right? One or two people are always picked as the one, you know, the hero. We, oh, Martin Luther King Day, we have that day every year and we should, you know, but do we know Fred Hampton, Bobby Seale, Angela Davis? You know, I don't think so. Certainly not the people I see. So this idea of picking a couple of people making a big deal about it and saying that that constitutes an honoring of an entire group of disenfranchised people is a lot of what we see. I think those are both really good points, Madeline. Um, I mean, I think about that kind of anointing, right, of, of a recognized <laughs> yeah. leader and then that somehow justifies that we overlook everyone else, right? And, and I think it gives us a really skewed notion of how real social change happens. I mean, that it somehow suggests that social change can happen because of one charismatic figurehead, as opposed to exactly. requiring the concerted efforts of a large group of people over a long period of time um, I mean, I wonder if we sometimes, like in the case of King, right? I mean, we even pick people whose careers are cut short instead of people who worked- Preferable. The Preferable, yeah. I should say, um, to work for an entire lifetime, much less sort of generational change, right? You know, generations of women, for example, who participated in the, in the movements for women's suffrage and then more generations still who participated in the movements to extend that right to women and men um, of color. And, and that it's, you know, I mean, one figurehead just really doesn't do it. So I think, you know, it's a disservice to history, but I think it's also a disservice to contemporary activism, that it gives us the wrong idea about, you know, how we make, how we collectively make change or don't, <laughs> as the case, as the case may be. So I think that's a great point. In terms I of- I think you write very Beautifully, uh, Anya, I think you write very beautifully in the book about how such, an, uh, such a way of thinking is the opposite of what Sophonisba and her colleagues uh, sought, which was collaborative effort to change, yes? Yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, Breckenridge was modest to a fault. Um, she, she actually wanted her papers to be destroyed, but her partner, Edith Habit, wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, thankfully, yeah. for me, um, and anyone who wants to know about her. But, um, but yeah, and, but the reason she was modest is because she wanted to place the spotlight on the work, not a few people or a singular person. Yes. There's, a, there's a great letter she wrote um, during the New Deal when a lot of the programs that she'd been advocating at the local and state level, you know, finally were federalized, like state level mother's pensions became what we used to call AFTC. And, um, and yeah. she says, you know, uh, in response to another woman who was active in the New Deal, you know, it's, it's fine that I don't get credit. You know, what really matters is that we finally, you know, make life better for people who need it. That is what Basically, she says, that's what it's all about, right? Um, and so she would purposely, if, it, if she thought it would benefit the cause, she would actually purposely work behind the scenes. She would um, feed language uh, to leaders, um, both male and female leaders that she thought would sort of get the ear of um, people like the president, um, if she thought that would work. So, um, so she may have done, <laughs> 
the United States a service, but she also did sort of herself a disservice by purposely playing behind the scenes. Um, but, um, but of course, I think that's one of the really interesting, the, one of the really interesting things about her. It's interesting what you say, Madeline, about her sexuality maybe be playing a factor because in her lifetime, her family, well, I don't know about Ella, Ella is her own thing, but the, <laughs> um, the rest of her family members were all fully aware of and um, apparently entirely supportive of her long-term relationship with Edith Abbott. And before that, her not quite so long relationship with Marion Talbot. I mean, they talked about her in letters and they invited her to stay at the family home and they sent gifts and they exchanged visits and the same thing on Abbott's side and on Talbot's side, Talbot's parents actually deeded the vacation home that they had to uh, Breckenridge and to her then partner, Marion Talbot, um, as joint tenants uh, with right of survivorship. So, I mean, like fascinatingly, right? So during her lifetime, this wasn't a problem. I mean, it's not like anyone ever labeled them as lesbian or queer or like they called themselves that, but certainly everyone was aware that the primary people in Breckenridge's life, depending on the time period, were Talbot and then later for the last 40 plus years, Abbott. And that doesn't seem to have really phased people then, um, but, um, but perhaps That's it became very... more problematic in future generations. Yeah. That's very interesting. Also a different branch of the family. I, you know, so, I really don't know. I have no information or insight into that one. For sure, yeah. I wonder, I mean, both of you are social workers, which is so like wonderful um, and fascinating. <laughs> and um, I wonder if you could both say more about how you see yourselves carrying on Breckenridge, my, my Breckenridge, Nisba Breckenridge's <laughs> <laughs> Nisba Breckenridge's legacy. Mm. You know, I when I, I had to reflect on in in learning about her, what's going on in the world right now, and working in the schools. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern in Chicago about equity. And so in the Chicago public school system right now, and, and you know that you know that was Nis. I, I'm just hoping you know in terms of her legacy, I can just support educational equity for the students of Chicago public schools because this the the uh, CPS has just opened up an office of equity. So there, I hope I, I look forward to seeing how that evolves because there are some really significant disparities uh, in education. You know when you compare more affluent neighborhoods in the city and the schools. And then, you know, where I work on the west side, there are very, it's very disparate, um, the opportunities available in the curriculum. So um, I hope <laughs> in honor of Sofanisba, I can, you know, help that process and help improve education for students and, you know, that I work with. Um, so. That would be, yeah, very a very apt way of honoring her. One of her earliest publications with Edith Abbott was a pamphlet advocating education as opposed to employment for working class and immigrant youth. Um, so mm -hmm. I mean, precisely that, right? Um, pushing mm -hmm. education as an avenue to um, moving closer anyway to equity. What about you, Madeline? Well, I'm not sure that I feel it as much in my professional life as my personal life, although of course one is the other in some sort of way. But uh, from the time I was in college in the late 60s, my politics have been completely in line with her politics, although I never knew that at the time. I was very politically active in those years and then when I, and I went to get a social work degree for community organizing, but as, but somehow all my placements were, were in psychotherapy in psychiatric settings. So I ended up with a psychiatric, uh, with a counseling practice, a therapy practice. And that's been 
my professional life. But part of what took me into that and stayed there is that I saw within the movement, within the anti-war movement, where I was active, within SDS, where I was active, within some of these places, I saw the same sexism, the same, uh, the, the same power dynamic politics of race, of gender, of class. Sometimes it was in the reverse, you know, reverence for the most oppressed, who was the most oppressed, well, it had to be a, a black lesbian woman. That was, there were great debates on that for months and then they'd land there, right? But I had an interest in all of those things. So that interest has carried forward and really informed me uh, in ways that are not directly related to my practice, although they infuse my practice, but it's, it's, it comes up more for me in a, a broad sense that people can be whatever it's in their hearts to be. And that shouldn't be determined by outside circumstances and the work of changing the institutions of the society should be not to change them from this to that, but to change them from restrictive to open, giving everyone that chance for personal act actualization, really. And it's also inspired my understandings and led me to take actions in some other parts of life, the Pasana meditation, which has now somehow reached the masses in the form of the word mind, mindfulness, it's a big thing now, but it came with, it came uh, big into the US through a couple of teachers from a tradition that began in Burma and, and some other countries. But the, actually the first, but the main teacher from the main river that popularized it in the US uh, was actually an African-American man who taught at Howard University. And he's the first person authorized by Sayad Yuvakin to teach Vipassana meditation, uh, Anapana meditation, a different version, uh, a concentration version uh, in America. You never hear his name mentioned either. There's a big New York Times article on the person who brought this to America, but that's not the person who brought this to America. The invisibility uh, until a candidate comes who, who fits the bill. So that sort of Marcusean type stuff. I think it affected my consciousness. There there's a consciousness that she embodied. And I would say I really resonate to her consciousness. I don't think it, I don't know if it has anything to do with being a relative, but it's strengthening to see that she could inhabit that consciousness as someone born in 1866. Brilliant. Um, I, I want to take this moment to bring in our audience members into the um, conversation. Um, and, I, and I guess I'll start with my own question, but if you are on Zoom, please feel free to type in the Q&A. Um, if you're on Facebook, please leave comments there and we'll try to uh, bring them in as well. But now's the time to ask your questions, not only about uh, family and relatives, in that kind of research, what that feels like, but also um, about uh, Sophie Elizabeth Breckenridge and women's activism. Um, but I wanted, did want to start off of your point, Madeline, about um, visibility and invisibility. And I work at a history museum, um, so we're very concerned about documentation. Um, and the whole house reformers are, we have, were strong documenters. And um, you, and um, your family has begun to kind of make their own documentation practice to really lift up um, not just Sophie Nisba, but the other women in the family that um, uh, contributed. And I think that those kinds of efforts on the part of individuals are really important because um, sometimes those are people that are closest and maybe most activated by their own history. So I'm hoping um, Jessica, um, you and Natalie could speak about a little bit more about um, uh, that document documentation process, um, the website you all have, right? Um, and also, um, you know, what do you think that does, you know, for yourself and your own practice and how you conceptualize it? And Jessica, if you want to start with that, your, your kind of own own finding and of uh, Sophie and Isabel and, um, and, and that, that family union and how that kind of activated you as well. 
Um, well, I'm going to defer to Madeline on the creation of the website <laughs> because I know she played a huge role in getting that going. I mean, um, I, I feel like, you know, everything I've learned and, you know, in regard to documentation that was, you know, that that I've, I've seen and I've read about the family um, was when I attended the reunion at University of Chicago. Um, they were amazing. They went into the archives and found all kinds of original papers that were written by Sofa Nisba. Books she wrote about social casework. Um, I think, and Madeline, correct me if I'm wrong, I, 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 there were some, some papers that she wrote that she presented at conferences, um, some pictures of the family, her, her degrees. Um, um, so I, and I, I seem to, you know, I, there were things there that I think some of the family members that were present had never seen, you know, um, and were just- Absolutely. Oh, she, yeah, she did this, she spoke on this. Um, I remember us seeing a paper she wrote, and we wouldn't use this term today in the field of social work, but care of the feeble-minded, which, you know, we would say today, care of the intellectually disabled or, you know, intellectual disability. Um, but um, it just was fascinating to me. You know, I, I can only imagine what kind of documentation is all over uh, the, the country about Sophonies, but that the family doesn't know about, you know, they had co copies of her diplomas of her economics degree, her political science degree. And we were all just like, wow, <laughs> you know, that's so great to see this and her, her original, you know, some of her original bodies of work. Um, so I'm not sure, Madeline, how that translates into the family website, but I know I, there was talk of doing another reunion to honor the women of the Breckenridge family. Um, but obviously COVID-19 put that to a halt, but I was really looking forward to, you know, getting additional information <laughs> at family reunion, but. Um. Yes, I know. Now Anya is gonna give us the right uh, dates and so forth, but she was the first woman to represent America at the Pan American Conference of 1930? 1933. Do I? Yeah. 1933. Okay. Right. So I think you can fill in a little more about that and then I can talk about the website. But, but yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a lot of, uh, Brecken has racked up a lot of firsts, right? She was the first to receive her PhD in political science and her Juris Doctorate um, from the University of Chicago. She was the first woman to be inducted into uh, a legal, uh, elite legal society class. Um, she was the first woman to be an official US delegate to an international conference that was in Uruguay, Montevideo, Uruguay, the Pan American Conference of 1933. Um, oh, going back further, I missed this one. She was the first woman to be admitted to the bar in Kentucky, right? I mean, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of firsts there. And in her case, fortunately, there's also a lot of documentation. I mean, Jessica, you were talking about the extensive papers that they have at the University of Chicago, um, which are great. There's even more than that at the Library of Congress, which holds the entire Breckenridge family papers. Wow. Just Sofa Nisba's portion of those papers is 39 archival boxes. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and, of, and of course, there are also letters to her and from her in the papers of the other family members. So that 39 boxes is not, <laughs> that 39 boxes is not the entirety of the collection to, to put it mildly. And then of course there's, um, I mean, because she, knew so many people and collaborated with so many people. There's papers of hers wherever those people left their footprints. So there's papers of hers and, and Adams and other whole house people and other people in the Women's City Club of Chicago and the, um, what's it called? Juvenile Protective Agency. 
and um, other uh, and the Women's Peace Party um, and the Women's Trade Union League um, at the, all of those are at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And then and then there's other papers just sort of other places depending on sort of who the official recipient was. So the Abbott papers are in Nebraska. Um, the, there are, unfortunately are no Talbot papers except for the ones at the University of Chicago. Um, but some of her other co-conspirators have papers in the Schlesinger Library, um, the Women's History Collection at Radcliffe. So yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot, <laughs> but there's still family things I haven't seen. When I was in Chicago in um, October, um, speaking at the University of Chicago's School of Social Service Administration, which was celebrating its, uh, its own centennial, um, I got to meet Bo Chalkley, who is another Breckenridge descendant, and he had a copy of memoirs written by one of the nephews that Breckenridge helped through school. And it was a particular nephew that I didn't know about. I mean, like, I knew that she helped her nieces and nephews through school, but I didn't know about this particular one. Um, so there's, there's still stuff out there that has not, um, you know, made its way into the kind of repository that, that I find. Um, so um, it's great to have people paying attention to that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, what a challenge. I mean, the scatteredness and how many places you had to go and how many <laughs> organizations and cities and so forth. And I, I really, the website, I began the website as a communication tool for the 2019 reunion. And that's how I thought of it. But in the development of the reunion, in learning more about Sofa Nisba, in seeing how scattered many things are and uh, lost all the time because someone passes and they didn't keep everything or the letters are just in storage and then they're gone and that sort of thing. Uh, I thought it might serve an ongoing, right now it's just skeletal but I think it could serve an ongoing purpose with links to the institutions with which the family has been connected, like Hull House, which gave us an amazing tour when we were there. And I, I learned, as everyone has said, an enormous amount at the University of Chicago, but I learned uh, uh, really as a social worker, Hull House was deeply fascinating to me, what was put out for us and what we learned that the, the methods, the, the really sensitive, spiritually sensitive, I would say methods that, that were used to counteract certain social ills, such as the alienation of parents from children in having a new, as immigrants, new language, new culture, the children outstripping the parents and serving as translators for them and all that generational disruption that happened and how programs, you'll have to forgive me, you at Hull House, because I may be remembering this somewhat incorrectly, but as I understood it, and my takeaway was that programs where families would come in as families and the children would learn some of the traditional crafts or skills from the old country and all would do it together. And it was used for family bonding and then having what we have too little of today for homeless people, having when there were cold water flats, having showers, having you know just basic things that allow a person to feel like a human being. And how, how did, and her, but I didn't know until I read your book, Anya, that her vision was, was not women have to get the same rights as men. Her vision was women are different than men. They have to be equal, but the laws, the protections, the supports need to be in some way gender tailored. So I didn't know enough about that to know what it really meant. I didn't know if we've sort of in our gender fluidity these days, uh, are we somewhat beyond that? Is it relevant today? I don't know. But that holistic way of looking at everything, whether it was law or social policy, or human services was tremendous to me. And if we could have a dimension of that consciousness inhabiting the website, I think it would be really wonderful. I don't really know how to do it. 
I'm keep, I keep hoping you'll do, <laughs> you'll do books for middle schoolers on some mm -hmm. of the people you've researched because that's such a key age, right? Yeah, I agree. I've thought about that. Um, uh, it'll be a it'll be a learning curve for me to uh, to translate. I'll need to do a whole. Oh, this is terrible. I'll have to do a whole reading course of reading books about women's history for middle schoolers. How how sad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, really not at all. Um, yeah, I don't know if. Um, oh, I think Ross, that you have this at Whole House, or uh, that you maybe got it, maybe right before COVID hit. The the new Rad American History A to Z. Yeah, so that's what I was going to mention. So the uh, Whole House Museum and our staff is always looking out for um, different uh, children's books um, that are connected to the Whole House history. There was a recent one that just came out called, I think it's yeah, Radical History for A to Z. Um, there are, every year there's a children's um, uh, book award related to Jane Addams. It's called the Jane Addams Book Award. Um, and that goes to a children's book. Um, there's also the Credit Scott King Book Award that also has a children's book lane so we're always looking for children's books that fill in the um those those kind of uh, uh early years but also middle school years as well um i do want to make sure we get to two questions that are that are floating in um i'll go ahead and ask those i think these are directed really toward you anya um if you know anything about the connections that um sofa shared with mary church terrell at all so um, that's a great question. I really wish that I did um, because uh, she went, uh, she was an African American club woman and suffragist, among other things. And she was one of the only African American suffragists to appear on the speaker's platform um, of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And she used that opportunity to call out the movement for its racism. And she went to my alma mater, Overland College. So <laughs> I would love it if I could document a connection. Uh, sadly, um, I can't. Um, Breckenridge did have a personal relationship and correspondence with um, Ida B. Wells, later Ida B. Wells Barnett. And she, uh, the nature of that correspondence was their collaboration, or really I should say Breckenridge's contributions to Ida B. Wells's anti-lynching campaign, her campaign for a federal anti-lynching law. Um, uh, she also had correspondence with both Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, which is interesting since they were in sort of different camps. Uh, with respect to African-American social welfare and civil rights. Um, she had a, a warm correspondence uh, with both of them, um, but, um, but those are the only um, prominent uh, na rec names that we would recognize, prominent names of African-Americans that um, I ran across in her, in her papers. Okay, great. And there's another question um, about Mother Cabrini and Chicago's immigrants, Chicago immigrant right history um, and the kind of connections there. And, the, and I guess it's also just important to um, mention because Hull House was a site that was founded to support the immigrant community on the west side of Chicago, very specifically toward um, transforming uh, the labor industries there, the textile industry there. Um, and so the connection to immigration and labor rights are really close um, and women were on the forefront of that effort. Um, so I just, if you want to say more about that or address specifically um, Sofanism's immigrant right uh, connections in history. Sure, so um, I don't know anything specifically about Mother Cabrini, um, I mean, um, with connection to Sofanisba Breckenridge. Um, Breckenridge, however, was um, very committed to the Immigrants Protective League, which I mentioned before. Jane Addams actually wanted her to leave the University of Chicago where Breckenridge was then assistant dean of women to head up uh, the, uh, the new organization. And there's a great story actually um, that the Abbott sisters told about this that Adams said to Breckenridge, you know, maybe you can find some capable man to assist you so that you can do this work. And, and Breckenridge fires back, I don't need to look for a capable man. Um, I have Grace Abbott, who, <laughs> who is currently finishing her degree at the University of Chicago, and she would be far better than any capable man. <laughs> and so, um, and so she um, 
passed after founding the organization, she passed the reins of leadership on um, to uh, the other Abbott sister, uh, Grace, uh, Grace Abbott. But Breckenridge herself remained the secretary of the organization for decades um, through several directors, actually. And, um, and she was very concerned with immigrant uh, rights as well as immigrant welfare. The, the Immigrants Protective League um, did a lot of legal advocacy to defend immigrant rights. Um, they, in, during World War I, uh, when many immigrants were being uh, in danger of being deported as suspected subversives, the Immigrants Protective League provided them with legal representation. It also provided them with legal representation so that they did not have to serve in the military since they had no citizenship rights. They also should not have been drafted, um, that kind of thing. And then in the, and then this work, I mean, just like the work at Hull House, this work continued and changed as the nature of, um, as the patterns of immigration changed, right? So whereas like in Hull House, the initial immigrants were mostly um, Eastern and Southern European immigrants. And then later there were more migrants from Mexico. Um, that also, you can see that shift in the records of the Immigrants Protective League as well. And so in the 1930s, what the league was up to and what Breckenridge was concerned about was this deportation drive aimed at Mexican migrant workers. Um, and that became the focus in the 1930s. And, and interestingly, it was um, Breckenridge's participation in immigrant rights work that is what finally, near the end of her life in the 1940s, got her on a list of suspected communists. Yeah. So unlike Jane Addams, and perhaps because she did kind of do most of her work behind the scenes, Breckenridge herself avoided um, being caught up in, in sort of red scare activities um, in the 20s and the 1930s. Um, but finally, in the 1940s, she was included on a list of um, fellow travelers. And the reason for that was because of her participation in immigrant rights advocacy. Um, that, that does kind of, I like that answer that question because it, it brings us kind of to the, to now, because there's so many questions about um, citizenship right now, deportation right now, um, immigrant populations in the United States, um, what kind of support do we provide? What kind of support do we not provide? Um, and I guess I, I wanted to ask you, Jessica, we're in the middle of a um, pandemic. This is a hundred year um, situation. Um, Jane Adams, of course, was in Chicago and working around the time of uh, the pandemic of uh, 1918, 1919. Um, and was addressing those issues in the neighborhood that she was living in. And now you're someone who's working in Chicago Public Schools. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect on what social work looks like to you now um, and the work that you're doing. Um, well, um, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of concern about mental health <laughs> um, with the students and families. Um, and how I think that's going to impact education in the school. You know, there, you know, just the trauma of going through um, the social isolation, and then you know, just with the COVID nineteen health crisis, African American, you know, families and you know, Latinx families have been disproportionately affected by that in Chicago. So just the uh, grief and the you know, issues that, that families must be dealing with, there's, a, there's quite a bit of concern. Um, and so, you know, I, I know we're looking at, you know, really trying to provide support for, you know, families and children <laughs> as much as possible uh, to, you know, in, in the context of the school, you know, and providing mental health services at school and, you know, making referrals to the community for, to help families, you know, get those needs met for support. Um, um, and then, you know, I think what I struggle with personally is that we're, we're doing remote learning. We're here on Zoom doing, <laughs> you know, a webinar. I struggle with trying to feel connected <laughs> to the students. Um, and right now that, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is I have students, I had a student yesterday uh, tell me that she missed me on Google Classroom. And, you know, it just, it, 
kind of breaks my heart that I can't be sitting in front of her, <laughs> you know, and, and talking with her. So, so that's very new, from a, you know, a mental health perspective and, and trying to be supportive at this time as a social worker and provide services. So um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that we're, we're trying to do, I think, as in being supportive to families and children as in the field right now, so. Thank you for that, Jessica. Thank you for that, that kind of on the ground perspective. I think that's important to know that some of the, um, the challenges that, that communities, especially on the west side of Chicago where the museum is located, um, are gonna, the, 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 the repercussions of the current moment are gonna be, you know, uh, years and years down the road as well. Yes. Um, it's yes. important to keep that in mind. Um, I'm hoping I can end with this question, which is kind of my favorite question um, to think about is, um, and this is to all, of, all three of you, but particularly you, Anya, what does this kind of history teach us? What can we take away from it um, for the current moment, but also for the future? Sure, that's a great question. So I think that um, one of the most important things that we can learn from this history is that it takes constant uh, effort and a long-term commitment to make positive social change and also to preserve the gains that have been made. And one of the things that has always struck me about Breckenridge's career is how she worked for decades to achieve some of the things that she achieved, some of which were not achieved at all during her lifetime, like a federal anti-lynching bill, and also that she had to constantly struggle against rollbacks of the things that had been achieved, which we are also very much um, seeing in the, in the present moment. So I think the importance of um, persistence and also the importance of um, not letting down one's guard, um, paying attention uh, on an ongoing basis are a couple of the important lessons that we can learn from her life and apply to our situation now and in the future. Thank you, Anya. Madeline, do you have anything to share with that too? Something quick came to me and it, I think Anya said it a lot better, but it was just, you know, keep standing up, keep speaking up. And I, I guess uh, I have, I've undervalued writing perhaps. I see that she's, she can become visible now because of things people wrote down and recorded. So that's, I have to think about that. That's a powerful message. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. <laughs>